Let me tell you a story about a moment in my career where I had to make decisions that would mean the literal difference between life and death for a patient. So my name is Amin, I'm a doctor working in anaesthesia and intensive care. Now, the situation I'm about to describe is a true event and it happened a few months ago. So picture this, it's midnight, you're the anaesthetist on call and you're just finishing up on a patient who's had an emergency operation. As you're waking the patient up, you start to realize that something's not quite right. The patient's not waking up as they're supposed to. You don't really need to look at the alarms at this point to know that something's going on. The way they're breathing is as if there's some kind of obstruction. You listen out for the alarms and you could hear that the tone is getting deeper and deeper. You do a quick assessment of the patient and you realize that they have a seesaw movement of their chest. That doesn't sit right with an anesthetist. You look at the alarms and you see that where seconds ago the oxygen levels were reading 100%, and now suddenly they're starting to drop. And you do a quick assessment of the patient again and you see that they're getting bluer and bluer. The saturations are now 70%. This is incompatible with life. So you're the only anaesthetist around right now. You can call for help, but it will take at least five minutes for help to arrive. You don't have that amount of time. Every second matters right now. So how did I find myself in this situation? Well, as the anaesthetist on call, we need to be able to put patients to sleep for emergency operations, be that day or night. Now, generally, if you think that there's going to be a problem based on your assessment, you can call for senior help. That could be a consultant coming in or advice over the phone. The difficulty, however, is when you have to make an assessment and everything looks like it will go fine from the outset. So your assessment of the patient's mouth and their airway and all of those things look like it would be a simple job. However, once you reach a critical moment, you then discover that things are way more complicated than they seem or something goes drastically wrong. So these are times where you need to fall back on your training and you need to stabilize the situation as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So the situation that I just described is something known as laryngeal spasm. That's essentially where the vocal cords within your throat seize up. And as they seize up, they stop the flow of any air going inside and outside of your lungs. What that essentially means is that your body is going to run out of oxygen. It's still demanding the oxygen, it's still using the oxygen, but there's just no supply coming in and out. The reason this would have happened in this situation is because as I pulled the breathing tube out of their mouth, it caused some irritation to the vocal cords. Now, this generally is okay and is well tolerated in someone who's waking up because they are then alert enough to overcome those reflexes. However, there's a very specific point when you're waking up where you're not quite awake, but not quite deep enough and relaxed enough for these vocal cords to remain open. Now, in this situation, a reflex motion kicks in where these seizures of these muscles stops any flow of air. The only way to manage that is to aggressively force air into the lungs. So what did I do in this situation? Well, the first thing I tried is to apply some positive pressure. What that means is I was squeezing a bag full of oxygen with the hope that by delivering it through this mask, I would get it through whatever crevices there were between the vocal cords. Now, if there was enough space, I could push this air down with pressure and inflate the lungs and provide them the oxygen that they need to survive. So I tried this, but I was only getting about 10 mils of volume at a time. And that's nowhere near enough. In a normal breath, you'd have about 500 mils of volume of air going in and out. The next thing I had to do was consider what medications I could give. Now I'd used propofol as an injection to send this patient off to sleep. Now sleep for anesthesia is a spectrum. If you get them too deep, there can be severe side effects, but if they're too light, they won't be ready for an operation. They'd basically be aware and awake. In that specific area where they're not quite awake, not quite deep enough to be asleep, there's something called a reflex laryngeal spasm that can occur, which is what, what's happened in this instance. In order to get them deeper, I'd need to give them just about the right medication to relax those muscles and take them from where they can have this reflex movement to where they're too asleep and too uh, relaxed to be able to do that. So I'd given this injection and within a few seconds, I could feel that as I was squeezing the bag of oxygen, I could feel the resistance was changing and I was getting more volume in and out of the lungs. I'd looked on the monitor and initially this was 10 mils, but this started rising and then it was 50 mils, 100 mils, and eventually it reached normal. Now, as I was doing this, 
the oxygen levels were gradually rising as well. Had they stayed the same, this patient could have suffered some, some disastrous effects. They could have had a stroke or possibly even died. Now, by doing this motion and giving those medications at just the right time, I'd managed to save them from that. So eventually the patient wakes up, they're awake and alert, and I ask them how things are going. They've got no recollection of this event as they were in that sleepy state. Luckily, there's no long-term harm that has come to this patient. I'd followed them up and luckily we'd managed to avoid any, any kinds of complications like that. But what this had highlighted was there's a lesson that can be learned from this incident. Not just that you need to be well trained and you need to be ready to act, but there was another thing that came to mind. And when I first started off as a doctor in 2015, a consultant once taught me when things are going terribly wrong and you find yourself in a difficult situation, you need to remember to be like a duck. And I was quite confused at first. I was thinking, well, what does that mean to be like a duck? And he said, as you're floating along, as you would do if you're a duck, you look calm and cool on the outside, on the top, but underneath you're flapping quite heavily. And there's a constant flapping. You're doing the work, you're moving forward. And as a doctor in these situations, it doesn't matter what's going on underneath. It doesn't matter how hard you're working or how much you're struggling. Sometimes in these situations where you need to assert some control and authority, if you're the leader, you need to make sure that you set the tone for the room. Now that means that you have to take control or at least to be perceived to be taking good control of that situation. Because if you don't, then the people around you won't either. And if the people around you don't feel confident in you, then everything will become 10 times worse. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you've got any questions or if you wanted to find out anything more, let me know in the comments section. Alternatively, follow my Instagram account and I'll post a few more updates about my life as, a, as an anaesthetist in the UK.